You're mute, David. You're, you're muted. You can begin. Thank you. Hello and welcome. I call to order this February 10th, 2021 meeting of the Needham Finance Committee. As a preliminary matter, let me confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Member when I, members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Josh Levy? Here. Uh, John Conley? Here. Tom Jacob? Here. Rick Lunetta? Here. Dick Riley? Here. Jim Healy? Here. Louise Miller? Here. And our staff member, Louise Misgard? Here. Good evening. This open meeting of the Needham Finance Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed <coughs> by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible, accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law, except for the agenda item entitled Citizen Request to Address the Finance Committee, the meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting, the Needham Finance Committee is conven convening by, by Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. <coughs> Please note that the meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference. Uh, all supporting materials that have been provided with members of this body will be available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. As a first order of business, I would like for a motion that this meeting would ask for a motion that this meeting will be continued to the committee's next meeting of February 17th, 2021, if a technical problem develops. Is there moved. such a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, let's just take a voice vote. Tom? Uh, yes. Josh? Yes. Dick? Yes. Rick? Yes. Jim? Yes. Ron? Yes. Louise? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Um, just before we do so, just let me cover a few ground rules. I'm going to introduce each speaker on the, on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motion. Please hold until your name is called. Um, First item on the agenda, are there any citizen requests to address the Finance Committee? <coughs> Madam Chair, I'm seeing no hands. Okay, very good. Then turning to the next item on the agenda, the approval of the meeting of the minutes of February 3rd, 2021. Has everybody had a chance to review those minutes? I know there were some changes. Thank you for the uh, corrections. Anybody else? Madam Chair, I move their approval. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, voice vote. Tom? Uh, yes. Josh? Yes. Dick? Yes. Rick? Yes. Jim? Yes. John? Yes. Louise? Yes. Great. Thank you. <coughs> So the next item on the agenda, before we turn to uh, finish the work on the budget, we just, I wanted to, and I, I think some members have had the request to really discuss the utilization of the stabilization funds with respect to the COVID expense warrant articles that are on um, the warrant, whose 
obviously we don't have the numbers yet included in the warrant, but I just wanted to talk about the funding of that warrant article. So, Dick? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, my concern with seeking to address the COVID issues through a financial warrant article is that at this stage, we don't know either the potential revenue available to address the COVID through grants, nor do we have a really good sense of what the expenses are likely to be. Consequently, to try to address our COVID liability, net liability through a financial warrant article, we have to come up with a blind estimate of, well, not blind, we, we may know a sense of what the gross expenses could be, but we don't have any real good sense of to what extent those expenses will actually be incurred, nor of the potential offsetting revenue. Therefore, we're just gonna come up with a best guest estimate. And to the extent that we reserve dollars for a financial warrant article, we have necessity underfunding other potential articles uh, where that money could be utilized. If we ac access a reserve fund, however, th while that does require a two thirds vote from the um, town meeting, we can defer that until the special town meeting in the fall, at which point we should have a much clearer idea of both the potential revenue and the probable expenses so I think that's a much more prudent way to cover that. Having said that, if we do go that route, we still need to fund the um, reserve fund articles, perhaps not 100% of it in this year, but if and to the extent that we take money out of that, we need to replace it. So right. we, we need to address that as well. Louise. So, um, I agree with um, Dick that we will have a much better idea of where we are at the time of a special town meeting in the fall. I think right now it is a little premature to <coughs> guess. I mean, we're really just guessing where we're going to be. Um, I also have a more technical question. If we were to propose or vote that a funding source be a stabilization fund, what happens to those funds if they are not expended? Do they go back to the stabilization fund or do they get released to free cash because they've now been appropriated through a warrant article for a particular expenditure? Yeah. Dave. Hey, Dave. <coughs> um, any appropriation, uh, once it's taken out of the stabilization fund, the only way it can go back into the stabilization fund is by an appropriation by town meeting. So it would close up to free cash. Hmm. The, uh, if I may expand, Madam Chair? Yes, please. Uh, to the points that uh, Mr. Riley and uh, uh, Ms. Miller had uh, mentioned, that was partly why it was presented as a warrant article because there's just too much that's unknown on February 22nd to commit millions of dollars to an expenditure. Those are just gross estimates of expenses that may or may not be incurred. And secondly, those are expenses that may be offset by federal or state funds, hence not requiring any appropriation of town resources. And therefore, uh, as a financial warrant article, the Finance Committee has much, a much longer time to think about and contemplate what would be recommended to town meeting because the financial warrant articles are taken up during the months of uh, March and April and perhaps as late as the night before town meeting. But if I, if I may, uh, Dave, you know, judging from, we had a school liaison meeting this morning and it, it almost seems that we, we might not know by May town meeting, even then, at least for the schools, A, what the numbers are, and B, what kind of offsetting uh, revenues we have in the form of care grants, further stimulus grants, 
So how really do we address that in May? And then again, to the point that perhaps then it's deferred until a um, fall town meeting. The, the most important thing that I want to leave the committee with is right now for your February 22nd submission, we just do not know what that number is and where the funding sources are. So it's, it's prudent to just hold off on recommending expenditure of monies or reserving monies for the sole purpose of expenses that we don't know. Dick. Um, I'd like to ask a follow up question of Dave. When you say we can defer to the fall town meeting, special town meeting, let's assume the appropriate number is $2 million. I'll just pull that out of the blue. Are you saying that at the fall town meeting, we could approve a financial warrant article for $2 million? Yes. Jim. And are you also saying that at that time, we could approve a different funding source, such as if we wanted to use stabilization fund monies for that purpose, we could do so at that time? Yes, that is an appropriate uh, uh, funding source for a financial warrant article. Thank you. Dick. Just for a follow-up, while that does give us nice flexibility, the problem is in order to give us that flexibility, we have to determine that there's $2 million that we could appropriate to the general budget at the annual town meeting that we won't. So we will to that extent, withhold $2 million worth of possible expenditures from the annual town meeting warrant. And while that may or may not be a good idea, it, it, I'm a little concerned about potentially choking off items that need funding that won't get funding because of this approach. Luis? So, the way I read the revenue summary, we have an additional $7.8 million in property tax increase, which are offset by a number of other um, decreases. But we still have a really, really hefty free cash amount. Even after offset, we have free cash an in of $12.5 million. So even if we were to assume that all of our free cash had to absorb the offsets, we would still have $10 million in free cash. Um, so I do think we're still pretty flush um, in revenue. So I, so I guess what I'm saying, Dick, is I'm not as concerned as you are that we don't have sufficient funding. I think we do have sufficient funding. Um, and property taxes are not determined until after the um, special town meeting in the fall. Yeah, I think I'm very sympathetic to that because uh, I'm not aware of items that have been deferred because of the need to set aside money for the this financial yeah. warrant article. So that's be one of the questions I would ask mm -hmm. uh, Dave and the town manager. Are there items that given druthers they would like to see approved at this town meeting that aren't being proposed because of the necessity to reserve for COVID? We, uh... yeah. I was just gonna ask, are we having a discussion about COVID expenses? Right now, Madam Chair. COVID expenses, yes. So, so if I may, it seems to me COVID is not an ongoing recurring <coughs> event, or at least it has not so far been established to be an ongoing recurring event. And so my own suggestion would be that we not use ongoing recurring sources of funding to fund COVID expenses. And so as we approach them and look at them, we should think about what the sources of funding are that we are appropriating or we're recommending appropriation from for each of these types of expenses. 
I think that was essentially my point. Aren't we, in yeah. effect, setting aside, take a member, the $2 million that will potentially be appropriated at, in a financial warrant article, and that will then be devoted towards meeting a COVID issue. So isn't that precisely what we're doing? Right, of non-recurring or reserve fund of some sort. So I go back to my question of to Dave, is there, is there any item which, given our brothers, or as John has mentioned before, arguably <clears throat> we could put this into uh, the reserve fund for the capital costs that we know are coming down the road at us? Um, the uh, recommendations of the town manager uh, are all fundable within the revenue stream, plus providing funds for one-time expenses associated with COVID-19. The question is, is the magnitude of the cost, which we don't know, which will determine if it's 100% um, fundable by, um, by free cash or by uh, some other reserve, because the question that's uh, and it's changing. Even today, there's been some changes to the FEMA reimbursements to cities and towns that uh, can lower the, the, um, the amount that would need to be appropriated by Needham. Jim. I don't see how we can resolve the issue right now. I really don't. I mean, I think it's a great discussion, but I don't see how we can resolve it because Number one, Dave's telling us we don't have the, the figures that we need, and therefore we're not able to consider what the total amount is and what the appropriation should be, where it's going to come from. So I think, I guess what I'm saying is I think we should probably wait a little bit more until we have more information. Um, but Dave, you're saying we might not have that information for Maytown meeting. Is that correct or? Uh, that's certainly what um, you've heard from the school department. I am, I cert, I do know that we'll know more in time for the annual town meeting than we do right now. And, but there's nothing to do with COVID that should hinder you in terms of your uh, primary actions tonight of uh, voting a operating budget for a preliminary operating budget for the town. That's my point. I think we should just delay that decision. Well, okay. John? Won't we discuss it when, you know, when we get to the, when the various warrant articles are coming in front of us in March and April and the proponents of those, if there's a proponent for an article, which I would assume with the Board of Selectmen for a, um, warrant article for COVID expenses, then this is when we would have that discussion, I, I, I expect. But it's that we will have that discussion. We will be having those discussions in March. That's what I said. And, and, and our pushback will be the push, well, pushback might not be the right term, but our point back will be, why are we, why would we be appropriating money when we don't know the certainty of it until the fall? Right. Okay, Josh. But either way, it sounds like we're no longer considering putting the money in the reserve fund. The, the options right now are between a warrant article in the spring or a warrant article in the fall, correct? I think we could put it in the reserve fund, but if we were to put it in the reserve fund, I myself would not recommend that it be out of recurring revenue. Because if we're increasing the reserve fund one time, because of COVID, that should be out of non-recurring revenue. But would grants then be considered non-recurring? So grants are, but I think what would happen is, so let's say we were to use $2 million in free cash, then it would simply go back and be eligible to be recertified for free cash <coughs> the following year. So basically we wouldn't spend it this year, mm -hmm. appropriated in the, um, reserve fund, and then it would become re-eligible, whatever that, you know, time period is. I'm not exactly clear on whether it's the following year or two years later. Okay. 
but I don't think we should raise taxes for COVID expenses. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. Uh, anybody else on this topic? Okay, if not, um, why don't we take up where we left off on the budget? And I know um, maybe we should start with the police department because there was a lot of questions about the clinical support uh, position and answers that we received from the chief. Josh? Um, so I'll just start. I think my main question was about why um, we would put this money in the police budget rather than the health and human services budget. Um, I think that the reply we got back from, from the police chief um, didn't exactly address my concern, just because uh, I think the police chief made the point that the police department has uh, more information at their disposal than typical clinicians do. And I, I think that's probably correct. This clinician is not going to be housed within the Needham Police Department even if it's overseen within the police budget. So I guess my question is not to, to hire a person within the health and human services, but rather keep the structure the same, but have it overseen by the health and human services budget. Hey, Madam Chair, um, when, when I read what, what John sent um, in terms of what just Josh brought up, what struck me was that the individuals who are under the auspices of health and human services good, bad, or indifferent, don't have the certification or don't have the requisite um, whatever um, to actually do uh, what this individual does relative to, I believe it's home analysis and, and survey and that kind of stuff to diagnose. Um, and so in essence, it seems to me that since they don't have that certification, then probably they shouldn't be residing there from a budgetary perspective and remain under the auspices of the police department. That's how I read that last question. Um, I could have, could have mistaken, but uh, I'm pretty certain that to be housed in, in health and human services would not, I don't think would put it correctly because their qualifications and certifications are different. I, I guess, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I guess my understanding is there, um, this, this person is a clinician, right? So they, their certifications um, are not related to law enforcement, are they? As I understand it, I, uh, the certification that this individual from Riverside is able to do um, is to do home assessment and analysis and something to do with, with, with validating, I guess, um, the diagnosis of the individual. So therein lies a particular certification for which a social worker that the town employs under Health and Human Services does not have neither that certification, nor that skill set, nor that capability. That's how I, that's how I understood um, the response to that question. And so in essence, it doesn't, I'm not trying to split hairs here, but if if Riverside has the capability uh, of that certification and our own folks do not, then it seems to me to make sense to put the money where the appropriate certification lies, and that would be in the police department. Um, you can also gain, I believe, um, some other aspects in looking at some of those other answers um, in terms of in terms of why that's that's there. The, my take on that. One, oh. well, just um, one, one other concern I had since last week is, um, I guess when I was thinking about the library budget, sometimes we're, um, uh, we notice that the library has funds um, to, to fund a, a new request um, from other sources. In this case, the police um, have already funded this position. And I'm just curious if, if they would have funds within the budget to fund this already. Yeah. As I understand it, maybe Dave can speak to this as well, because I'm sure he worked with John in terms of 
the budget formation. But what they did was they, they engaged in this endeavor and they took money from a part of the budget that they thought they could put towards this expense. And now that they want to move forward with it, um, they want to ground it um, in their operating budget and move forward. And so I, I can understand the fact because all of us in our own businesses have done this from time to time, pull money from Peter to give it a try. And if it works, then do something more than you know, taking it away from Paul. And I think they did exactly the same thing. And now they're asking, they're not asking, they're, they're telling us what they want to do with, you know, with the money in which they allocate towards their budget. Please. Do we know where the money came from this year to fund this? I, Dave, I, I don't know the answer to that. David? It's a, uh, Adam Chair. Sure. Um, it, it's a contracted service that uh, they entered into uh, uh, about half time in the year. It's, uh, uh, it was a pilot program instituted by two police departments working together in a joint procurement for services. It's not a position, it is contracted services. It's individuals for the company that will be providing these services, but it's not a position. Uh, that's, that's one thing. So that's when they say there's no, the person mm -hmm. not sitting in the police department, not right. sitting at uh, Health and Human Services. They're providing resources to assist the police departments in dealing uh, with uh, uh, individuals that uh, um, that are having uh, mental health issues, and also providing guidance to officers on how best to. Um, to deal with uh, such situations, both on a training standpoint and individual intervention. The savings, um, how they're paying for it is some expenses were lower this year. In part, fuel prices had dropped dramatically. So they had some extra flexibility by uh, using dollars that would have been spent for fuel. They also did not have as much uh, offsite training expenses. So those uh, dollars that would have gone for offsite training uh, help, uh, are helping to pay for this cost. But they will need this additional money to cover the cost annually um, in fiscal 22. Jim? Um, I know. <laughs> I, I'm young and I don't really get it all, but Dave, can departments expend monies for a purchase of service or an expense that was not budgeted? In other words, can they take savings, as you called it, and then use it for some other purpose that was never appropriated, never approved by town meeting? That's, that's my question. And my comment is the one that I already made. I am 100% in support of this. I think this is as important an initiative as any that the town is doing. But it seems to me, I would rather purchase the service rather than this notion of however many hours we're gonna get. I would rather be able to uh, do this on call. But anyway, so that's my question and a comment. The, uh, the question about uh, departments, they have the flexibility to, for expending their monies for contracted services and expenses uh, during the course of the year. They build a budget based upon how they anticipate monies will be spent, but there are changes in, and, um, and departments have that flexibility. In the case of the police department, they opted for this contracted service over other contracted services that they did not uh, need as much this fiscal year. Uh, so can I just follow up? But, and, and I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to learn. And I, I don't know how to say this better, but so what if they wanted to have a purchase of service for, I don't know, a, you know, a, and I, I try not to be silly, but something that we would never want to do. Like what, so you're telling me they can spend whatever money they want, as long as they underspend on some expense, they can spend it for whatever they want. Is that what you're saying? And, and if that's true, that's fine. I just, yeah. that's new to me. 
it, they can't spend it on anything they want. It has to relate something to their department. Um, and um, let's say they wanted to get uh, uh, yellow uniforms. We want to get yellow uniforms from now on. We don't like the rest. We, we're going to get yellow. We're going to go all the way yellow. So they can do that. That's their discretionary authority. Yes. Is that new? <laughs> I mean, I know I'm an old guy, but is that a new thing? No, it's not. Yeah, I actually disagree. I, I disagree. We put into the budget uniforms. If they don't like the first set of uniforms they get, they don't get to spend on a second set of uniforms and then not do training. There's no point then in having any of the budget hearings if we're not talking about anything real. So I, I do think if there are budget savings, those end up being savings at the end of the year that go out to free cash. Departments can't simply say, oh, well, you know what? I put in $4 per gallon for fuel. It turns out it's only two. I now have 20 grand. What can I spend it on? I, I have a problem with that as a concept. Um, and so, so, and I think we did have that with a couple of departments where if certain things aren't being expended, then they're, they get expended on something else. And I think the town manager does have the authority to say, well, you know, you have these savings. We will spend it on something, you know, whatever it is that we need this year. And it could be COVID related here, the COVID, these were COVID savings, but we also have COVID expenses. And so I think at the end of the day, there has to be some kind of a accounting for what the COVID savings were and then what the COVID expenditures were and how were these all reconciled. Um, so I don't think it's a free for all that we just, we're just giving them a bottom line budget and they can do anything they want with it. Yeah. Madam Chair, I, I don't think it's a free for all. Um, I think at the end of the day, they have to live within their means. And I think in this particular case, it wasn't, and I can't speak for the chief, and indeed you can speak to this probably far better than I, but in my conversations with him, I didn't get a sense that they were just gonna buy popsicles for the department. They thought, to Jim's point, that this was a valid way to solve a particular need in their business to supplement a skill set that they needed to supplement for the benefit of delivery of service, and they went about to do it this way. Now, um, I suspect they could have chosen 15 other ways. I don't know. They happen to chose this way, um, and they seem to be able to make it work for them to the betterment of their service delivery. And... So I, I, I don't think it was frivolous. And I think you're right. If they go off to, you know, to do something frivolous, then it makes these conversations really somewhat meaningless. Um, and so to, your, to, to the point, um, I think there's got to be some measurement. And I think that's the overall, you know, living within your means. And if you don't, why didn't you? But that, another one man's opinion. Is there, uh, Dave, some materiality level that you know a particular department can't go above in terms of spending that wasn't provided for in the budget the people uh, prepare their budgets with the anticipated costs for certain uh, assumptions and they have to live within that. If there are new expenses that they're able to absorb within their budget, they must be able to live with that going into the future year or it must have an end date. In the case of this program, it's a pilot program. It will end on June 30th. The only way the program can continue is with additional funding. But that was the way for them to know that this is something that would work for the department uh, in, in the long run. They cannot exceed their appropriations and they can't be purchasing things that would not be reasonably associated with their mission. 
Louise. I just want to go back. So this is probably a really bad example because I think all of us agree that this clinical support is really um, important for the police department. Um, and so I think um, for me, the question still is, is having a single person hired by Riverside assigned to Needham and Dedham the best way to do this? Or were we looking for a 24 seven um, yeah. on call yeah. service, which the police department did respond to. And so my understanding of the service now is a little bit different. It isn't a service that's provided when the call and the intervention occurs at the police level, but it's a follow-up service. It does, both. It does both. It does um, both, correct? It, it does both. If, if that position happens to be available, um, then they respond. Um, but if not, then it's a follow-up, which frees up one of their policemen not to have to sit forever and do reporting. So it does do the same thing the chief has been saying um, for a long time. Um, and it's interesting, in one of his responses, he also talks about the fact, and this is another question, um, you know, Riverside doesn't offer that, that service. They don't have someone sitting there that can be dispatched 24 7 7 you know, whenever. And so in essence, they too have limitation. Um, but it, it, as David said, and as a chief has said, that it's a pilot, um, and they didn't see some value in it, and now they're looking to continue to fund it. And who is to say next year they don't, they don't find another provider and decide to do it a different way? You know, I, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's my understanding that this is an identified person. It's not 40 hours worth of service a week. It's right. an identified person who will work specific hours, sometimes housed in Dedham, sometimes housed in Needham. So this service is not going to be a 24-7 service either. It's going to be whatever hours the identified individual works. That's right. So I think it is certainly appropriate for the finance committee to argue whether that's the most efficient way to utilize a service where the person is housed i suggest while we might have an opinion it's not something that's within the purview of the finance committee whether we spend it on an identified person or an equivalent amount of service hours or double that amount of service hours i think is something for the finance committee to express a view on. And I will express my view. I think, I think, I think getting service hours makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Um, it, makes, it makes great sense. But to listen to the chief, he's of the belief, well, I really shouldn't be speaking for him, but as I understand it, this individual will do the analysis that will allow his patrol folk to be able to leave. And so in essence, it's more in terms of follow-up than acute presence. Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, this particular model seems to make sense, although I would agree with you that it may not be the most efficient way you know, to put all the marbles in one bag. But it's not so much that they're going to ride alongside with a shotgun with a policeman as they show up at a house where there's a problem. Uh, and it's more of a follow-up to free up that officer to go into the next acute call. Um, and that follow-up can take place. And he also said that if indeed that person isn't there, they would take the person off to the hospital, which I think he answered in his question. Um, that would seem to take care of that, that slot. Um, and then I want to stop talking because that reaches the level of what I've been able to take out of the questions that he's answered. Um, I don't pretend to have knowledge here. Yeah. Jim. I, I think I, I would uh, vote to approve this request. And I think the only thing I would suggest is that we continue this, which apparently the police have already started, as kind of a trial and to see whether or not this is the best best way to provide what I do believe is a very critical 
service. It, I don't. I don't think I can get behind. Uh, I've tried a number of questions, and Rick's been very, very helpful. But I don't think I can get behind why the chief thinks this is the best way. But he does. He thinks this is the best way to do it. And I happen to think it's a critical service. So, at least in my view, I would support uh, moving forward with this, but only on the condition that during this next fiscal year, we could have some further review and discussion about, is there a better way to provide what I think is a very needed service in the town? All right, Louise was first. So the only other item I would add to this is last year we funded two additional police officers because the police department felt that they needed specialized services. This was actually an item of discussion at town meeting and I think it would be helpful for us to understand what the additional police department positions are and how the, these additional services are going to help the department overall. Um, so, but I, I too, I mean, I think I too am in favor of adding these services, um, just maybe, you know, we, we just need more information and, but I'm not going to vote against it this year. And Josh, did you have your? Oh yeah, just to respond to Louise's comment. And I think it, one of those police officers that was added um, of the four that were added over the past three years was specifically related to mental health services. So yeah. it's, it's not clear uh, to me how that position differs from or, or works in conjunction with this proposed position. Um, and then uh, in response to, to Jim's comment, I, I, you may not like this, but when we do pilot projects or you know, pilot expenditures, we typically do that as a financial warrant article. Um, is that something that we would wanna do in this case? Yeah, I, was, I had that same question, but I, let me just add to Josh. I think that that specific position that was added that had specialized mental health training was quite different than this position here because that individual, because I asked the question, I didn't understand why they couldn't just hire a social worker. And they said, it's somebody that had holy, that was a, a police officer that had the ability to carry a weapon, but also had specialized mental health training that could go in as a pair, you know, into the home in crisis. So I think that's really different than the services that they're purchasing through Riverside. It do. is different. So, so I guess that brings me back to my, my initial point about um, why, why, why it's housed in the police department, even though it's, it's serving the police department, it, it is a mental health service distinct from all of the other services that are currently provided by the police department. I guess my general feeling is that if we want to foster collaboration across departments between health and human services and police, I think we need to have positions that are overseen by, by both departments or either department. But if we, if we restrict all of the positions um, to one department, all in police, then that doesn't really foster the collaboration that we're going after. Um, so I, I guess I would still be in favor of, of having this budget be in the health and human services department. I don't think it would ultimately change how the services are rendered, but I, I do think that it would um, foster more collaboration between police and health and human services. Uh, I don't know who had their hand up first, Dick or Jim. Uh, I defer. Okay, Jim. That's entirely inappropriate given your standing and long tenure with the committee. <laughs> but uh, I didn't say I surrender. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, I I I have listened to that um, very nice argument now for three meetings, and if uh, that's fine, if that's what the committee wants to do, um, but I guess at some point I think we just need to decide: is that what we want to do? I 
don't agree with it, respectfully. I think this is a police issue. It's a police matter. I think that's where they need that support. Um, so I don't want to give it to another, another department. And I'd like the police to be responsible for it and the police to be able to, to uh, avail themselves of it when it's there. Um, but if my colleagues say it's, a, it's in a better place somewhere else, I'm happy to go with it. I do think it's a critical service. I've now said that maybe 10 times. So I'll agree with, uh, with Jim. I think that it's a critical service. I think we should approve it. Um, I'm tempted to, to say maybe we should try to approve it as a warrant article for a year just to see if it's effective. But I, I believe it belongs in the police department, not health and human services. And I think, honestly, the chief was pretty clear there that part of the role of, of this, these purchase services is that these individuals are trained in involuntary uh, committals to psych institutions and health and human services is not trained to do that. And I think that it's probably a critical need, you know, for policing because they're presented with those issues a lot more. So I would vote to recommend this request and the police budget. Madam Chair, can I move that? Yes. We accept the budget for $7,525,435 as, as written here. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, let's take a voice vote. Tom? Uh, yes. Josh? <laughs> I just want to say beforehand, did, did we want to consider the possibility of this as a financial warrant article? I think we can recommend that and still recommend the funding of it. Okay. Yeah. I'll vote yes. Dick? Yes. Rick? Yes. John? Yes. Louise? Yes. Jim? Yes. Okay, so this is approved and recommend recommended as a warrant article for, do we want to recommend it as a warrant article for two years or a year or? That was in my motion. That was not in your motion. If that's where you want to go, then I need to withdraw my motion. My motion was to keep it in the budget. Gary, yeah, what's your vote? Yes. No. <laughs> Maybe so. Sorry about that. I was actually entertaining some of our citizens, so. The mask, I hope. It's Florida. <laughs> it's optional, but I'll take it with me anyway. So. If I may, so if something is in the operating budget and next year we determine that that's not where it should be, then we're in the position of having to cut the budget. If something is in a financial warrant article and we determine that it is not, it doesn't turn out to be what we thought it was gonna be, then it never makes it into the budget. So I think that that's the primary difference between the two between whether it's a financial warrant article or in the budget. Either way, I think we're recommending recurring revenue for this. Yes. So, so that's really the only difference is that once it's in a budget, if we don't, you know. Well, it's hard to extract. I'd like to, I'd like to think if at the end of this, this trial period, so to speak, this other, this other still trial, that it doesn't work, or they want to do something differently, they would, they would bring that forward, and it fundamentally wouldn't be a decision of ours, um, right? If, if they want to move forward with this and stick it in their budget, then we can have that discussion. But 
I would certainly rely on them to come back to us and say it was a it was a viable experiment that worked. And we want to go full time or figure out to Jim's point, maybe another more viable way to get this 24 um, seven, which would lead the conversation differently. Tom. I think the, <clears throat> the difference, uh, the warrant article concept, um, when we had the discussion, for instance, on the PIO, which we'll have again soon, I assume, um, there was a lot of um, and doubt may be too strong a word, but we needed, we were misunderstanding or we didn't understand it completely. And so we, that's why we did the pilot. What I'm hearing from everybody on the committee is that this is a, a critical need. And so that to delay it, we're going to improve it in the budget anyway. It, the questions that we had were really how it should be spent and how it should be managed, which I think has probably been heard by the police department and the town in general. Um, but I would not support having this in a warrant article. I think this is something we want in the budget. Thank you. So, uh, Dick? I, I, as much as I admire Tom's analysis, I come to the exact opposite conclusion in that once it's in the budget, it's very hard, inertia takes over and it's very hard to reposition it. I think it's clear from our discussion here that there's a lot of concern about whether this is the best way to spend these dollars. So I would be very much in favor of <laughs> spending the dollars, but doing it under a structure that in effect mandates it be looked at again in a year's time and a decision made after we've had some chance to evaluate it. Here, it's gonna be very hard to uh, you know, put the genie back in the bottle, if you will, or the paste, toothpaste back in the tube. <clears throat> Whereas by doing it in a financial warrant article, it is of necessity going to be looked at again next year. Tom. Yeah, I guess my response that I understand that, uh, I, I just, trying to understand to what level we discuss the micromanaging of departments. Um, we, we've put forward a lot of questions here, which again, will be relayed to the appropriate bodies, but we've all said the services needed. Uh, many, I assume, I'm not sure if everybody, but most of us want it to be in the police department. Um, so I'm not sure we need to reevaluate the need for it and talk about where it should be housed and who should manage it and should it be 24 hours. And I think, I think the town management can handle that. Um, so I, I don't think we need to reevaluate this um, later. I think we've all agreed that it's an important service. So. Yeah. So I, I'm happy to make a motion because I, I tend to think that though the the services um, are valuable and, and I think we agree that they're valuable, it's just how they're delivered that, that we have questions about. So I, I'd be happy to make a motion um, that um, the police budget, um, the recommended police budget by the finance committee be in the amount of 7480435 dollars which is $45,000 less than the town manager's recommendation and that um, the $45,000 to support um, these services be uh, recommended in a financial warrant article. Second. So a quick point of order. Did, didn't we just vote? Did <laughs> yeah. we just approve a different number a few minutes ago? We didn't yeah. actually vote. We didn't finish the vote? Okay. but we did reserve the right to discuss it as a Warren article. So let's just take a vote on the Warren motion for the budget in outside and in a Warren article or not. That's a point of clarification, Madam Chair, the motion that we just voted on, did we not accept that or not? And if we did, what does that mean? And if we didn't, what does that mean to the one we're about to vote on? So technically, being a veteran of old town meeting <laughs> is that we take all of the motions in the reverse order in which they are presented. 
So the first motion that would be before us would actually be a motion to amend, a motion to amend Mr. Lunetta's motion to fu fund the full police budget. And instead we'd have the motion to amend from Josh. If the motion to amend prevails, then that wins. If not, then we go to the main affirmative motion. See, I should have been moderator. I, I know that was my calling. You did that very well, by the way. <laughs> I hope so, yes, so we go to Josh. It's good that we're recording this because I hope Louise got that all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're taking it in backwards order. Madam Chair, Sorry. Louise, Louise has, a has a point here. Sorry, Louise. Executive I have a question because the first motion was voted. Right. So it hasn't, I well, mean, no, it, I like it was well, brought up and then a motion to amend. I never voted I just, in favor. I don't, we didn't vote in favor. We didn't take a vote. So oh, we're not voting in favor of a budget. We're right now still discussing what our draft budget will be that is presented to the town manager. And so I think if there are certain members, this is just my own view, if there are certain members who feel like this, they would prefer it to be a financial warrant article, shouldn't we let them you know, have their say, and then we can decide whether we agree or not. I, I don't think there was a vote taken. Um, I have no problem with that, Louise. I agree exactly with what you're saying. I'm just, is it yeah. the Robert Rules issue? I, at least some of us did vote. The vote was stopped midway, and that's what I don't understand. Right, really. and it, because I think Josh raised a question midway. Okay, that, that's all I'm just trying to figure out, because I think that's what Louise has to figure out, how to record that in the minutes <laughs> as well. I mean, how I understood it, how I've recorded it, is that Rick moved to have the whole, Kate's whole amount put into the um, Finance Committee's budget. And then Josh did say, is it possible it could be funded in a financial warrant article? And he said, and, if so, yes. And then, and, yeah, so there were more votes. I didn't and Rick, keep and Rick said, vote. Rick said, that is not my motion. Correct. So Rick was very clear that he did not agree with the amendment that Josh had made, which is fine, which is appropriate. So I guess the question now is, I think there's a, a motion to amend in essence, or a new emotion that basically says they want to, whatever Josh said, set aside the 45,000 as a warrant article. Mr. Roberts, can you, um, <laughs> can, can we, do we finish the first vote? Um, and see if that passes or not before we entertain um, an amendment? Good question. I think it's appropriate to finish the vote. So we're, we're not taking formal votes. We haven't taken right. formal votes on any of the lines. <laughs> that is true. Right. Okay, so I think right now we are just discussing things as a finance committee. So that is reasonable. We didn't vote on the other lines up to this point. We right. haven't voted on any of the lines. All right. Therefore, what? Well, then I think we should just take a vote on whether we want this included as a warrant article. Do or we, not. Yeah. Do we generally agree with Josh or not? In all, generally, or just on this issue? <laughs> on this issue? No, no, no. We're not talking the... about generally. We're just talking about this one particular issue. <laughs> Generally, I, I I like Josh. Um, in this particular in this particular case, um, I would certainly let the police department um, have their way with this, um, as long as at the end of it they determine in a reasonable way if they want to move forward full time or whatever. I, I think it, the decision belongs to them, um, since they're into it already and they've done the deal with. With that, I'm Lord knows what that would do if we now take that to a warden article and if they decide to say no, what happens? Um, I just assume keep it here and let it run its course. At a $200 million budget, 45000 maybe not all that great to, to try this out. So Madam Chair, I guess I would just ask, where is the consensus of the membership? And I'd just say, do you, do you want a financial warrant article or not? And then see where we are. Okay, Jim. 
uh, warrant article. Barry? You know, I, I, I like what we have done in the last few years with things that are new and, um, you know, worth observing how uh, a particular new position, for example, is, is uh, performs and whether we get the results that we're looking for. And we've done that in a few occasions. I think it's worked very well. Um, I know we're going to discuss the PIO and, and I think that's also worked very well. And I think this is another example. It's probably worth, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we want to have a person like this on in our 100% on in our um, employ down the road if we find that there's a real need for it. And um, so I think doing this with Dedham is a good first step and it probably should be segregated into warrant articles. So I would vote for the warrant article. Okay, John? Warrant article. Louise? Warrant article. Dick? Warrant article. Josh? Warrant article. Tom? Uh, in the budget. And myself, I'd prefer it in the war as a Warren article. So I guess we are approving the police budget with the clinical support as a Warren article. Is that correct? My understanding. Okay. And this is just a draft budget. Yep. Right. All right. Uh, fire. I have to recuse myself. Oh, right. Thank you for reminding us. Oh, she left. <laughs> I would just uh, make a comment that I think the, the grant monies for the eight additional fire officers, uh, this, is, this will be the last year that it's being funded, if I'm um, correct about that. So just in the next year, um, so for fiscal 23, um, I, I would hope that um, we can just look at those eight positions and make sure, um, kind of evaluate the, the success of those positions since they'll be uh, funded 100% within the budget. Any other discussion on fire? Or generally approving fire as is? Okay. Complete with stair chair. Good with that. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want the stair chair in a Warren article? No. <laughs> uh, building department. I don't think there's any open issues there that I'm. There aware. really aren't. Does anybody have any? No. So that no. one looks fine. Needham Schools. And this is the, this is the ex-COVID, this is before COVID budget. This is just their operating budget. Sorry, is this Minuteman or the Needham Public Schools? Needham Public Schools. Okay. Did have, anybody have any discussion there or we okay with this budget. Good to go. I mean, I think I was okay with this budget. Okay. Spend, a half, spend an hour on forty-five thousand and say nothing about eighty-three million. But I, I have no issue with it. Though. Oh, sorry, I, Josh, and I. Yes, I skipped over minute minute, and I apologize. So, going back to that. It is what it is. Yeah. That, yeah there's nothing we can do on that one. So building design and construction. So obviously, <laughs> I'm not sure they heard us or if it was always, it seemed like it was always happening this way that uh, just wasn't discussed. <laughs> well, and 
I'm a little confused that it's two FTEs, but. Well, the two FTEs, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, one of them is a retirement. Yes, that one and, I'm not confused about. It. And, and then the other one, that individual is then being redeployed into another group. Is that right? Okay. So it's it's two out of building design and construction, but it's kind of one less individual to the town. So are we okay with that budget? John, are you okay? And I'm, I'm glad that we, um, I'll say we were listened to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, the DPW. Madam Chair. Josh. Um, so uh, since our uh, conversation, I think two weeks ago with Park and Rec, um, I just followed up with the DPW about how they had supported uh, the pool in the past uh, with the mm -hmm. opening and closing. Um, and I got some additional information back that um, uh, in years past with the new pool, um, the DPW has provided about 50 hours um, of support in the startup and then an additional 50 hours in support for the close of the pool. Um, and those funds, um, I believe, are still in the overtime budget for DPW. Um, so that's just additional context um, related to, to the, um, actually related to the park and rec budget, but um, where the monies were previously spent in, uh, in, through DPW and now are being supported um, through an additional request by uh, Park and Rec. So does anybody else have a comment on DPW? Well, let me just ask a follow-up question to Josh. If the function is now housed in Park and Rec, does DPW need these funds? Dave Davison has an observation. Dave. DPW has an allocation for overtime for everything they do. The fact is that Park and Recreation basically ate into their operational time to do other things in order to assist them. It's not as though the money was given to DPW for the sole purpose or ever with the intention of maintaining the pool. It just when the pool needed assistance, DPW um, assisted. Okay. So if I understand correctly now that if, if the funds are approved in um, Park and Rec for uh, the additional pool maintenance, then DPW's time will be freed up um, to do additional unrelated activities. Uh, it would be expected that DPW wouldn't uh, be asked to do as much as they had been asked the last few years. They still will be doing landscaping and work like that. So, I have no other comments about the DPW budget. All right, so are we ready to okay the DPW budget? Are we fine with that one? Yes. I actually love the idea that they're hiring, hopefully hiring some interns. Yep. And there was a significant, def there was a deferral of a number of other requests that I think um, needed to be deferred next year. So that was also reflected in the mm -hmm. recommendation. All right, municipal parking. Anything there? Nope. Health and Human Services. Well, I'm just. Yeah surprised that they don't need more money than they're asking for, given all that's going on. 
but they aren't asking for it, so. Well, was, no, that's not exactly. There was a warrant that, article. There's too. a warrant article for for their need for what they're going to need for COVID. And and Tom, did you know the what's the magnitude of the warrant article? Like they have they said? It was like one hundred thirty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. It was. It wasn't huge. It it, it actually so, matches, it assumes twenty thousand vaccines given, given to the town, which is probably is 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 conservative. So, are we all okay on health and human services? Yes. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Uh, Commission for Disabilities. We're okay on that one. Yep. All right. Same with Historical Commission. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Library. <laughs> <laughs> I'll defer to Louise. <laughs> Girl. Oh, Tom. Yeah, I've been thinking about these state aid funds for quite some time, and I probably don't know the history. But now I'm now I've become over the last week I've been thinking about it a lot, and I've come to the conclusion I think they should be used only on operational services. My thinking there, and again, I don't know the history, and somebody can can educate me if I'm wrong. But when when this state aid was started. I can't remember how many years ago, it was two decades maybe, um, when the libraries were being- Careful, Tom, that's when I was there. Okay, so, well, you can educate me. So I, I don't have a problem with what, what it is. I'm just trying to understand what the original purpose was. And my thinking is the original purpose was to make sure that the library stays open. And in my thinking, then that means that should be part of operational um, I'm not saying they're grants and all those other things should be, but these are monies that I think were provided by the state to make sure the library stays open. So that would mean daily operations. Uh, Dick? No, no. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Jim? Sorry. Unfortunately, I was around back then and uh, I had the library budget well before Louise took, uh, took over uh, back in the mid, in 1990s. They'll never agree to going back to you, Jim. <laughs> I don't know. Ann McFate, uh, we were tight. I don't think so. <laughs> so, um, but here was what they did, Tom. The state was very crafty. They said, here's what we're going to allow this state funding for. What we're not going to allow it for is to keep the library open. And the theory was they wanted each municipality to keep the library open based on their own budget dollars. And then they would supplement that with these additional funds. Now, keep in mind, that's coming from 24 years ago. So maybe it's all changed. So I'll defer to Louise for the, the real world. But that was the original purpose, as we were told. And, and the Finance Committee back then had kind of the same uh, thought you did, Tom. We said, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, for crying out loud, it's all going to operations. Why should the town, and at that time, Remember, 1995 was a huge override a year. We had, uh, I think, 10 different override questions on the ballot. We were really in bad trouble. Hmm. Um, but we were very clearly told that, you know, you're not going to get this. These state funds can't be used for X, Y, Z. But, Louise, I'll defer to you no. for, the last, for the last time. The last time tonight? On this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... The library, we are required to fund at a certain level if we want to maintain certification. And I think that level has been met. So with respect to the state aid, the state aid is not guaranteed. It never has been guaranteed. So what we were trying to do is balance between what is it that's a recurring necessary expenditure for the operation of the library, which should really be in the operating budget versus what is not. Obviously, if we grow the operating budget, then that means next year, 
we have to maintain it at a certain level or now we're going to drop below the certification level. Um, so I think that it's okay to keep recurring expenses that aren't absolutely necessary, like the nice to have as opposed to the, if we don't have these, our library doesn't look like a library. Um, I will say for the overdrive basic, the overdrive advantage. So the basic subscription is something that every library has. That is the ability to get books um, electronically as opposed to hard copy books. The overdrive advantage enhancements, that's just so you don't have to wait to get your book. So like I would distinguish between those. Um, but in terms of what the recommendation was by the um, town manager, I mean, the town manager has deferred the position that we had questions about, which was the reference librarian, digital communication specialist, and the library pages. The library pages continue to be funded out of the um, state aid account if there are not surplus funds in the personnel budget line. And um, the digital communication specialist is something that we'll probably discuss with the information, public information officer, because those seem to be similar types of positions um, that are being requested by different departments. So where I sit is that I, I think that the recommendation is a fair recommendation for the library budget. And if there is anything that we would look at to be funded from the state aid, it would be the Advantage program, the $17,000, because that's the, it's really nice to not have to wait for the books, as opposed to the Overdrive Basic and the WorldCat subscription. So that's your, that, that was my, my answer to you, Tom. Yeah. Rick. Madam Chair, I was on Ann McFate's dance card, I think, before Louise was. Um, <laughs> and, and I've always been a purist, um, I think, when it comes to the, to the state funds. And I, and I said this to Ann, and, and Ann thought, God, I was going to steal every book in the library. That <laughs> Let the state pay for what the state's paying for until such time when those grants begin to dry up, and then deal with it in operations. Um, and so, but they never thought that be appropriate. And given the fact that there's friends of the library and there's trust funds and there's all other kinds of stuff, um, I thought if the state's going to pay for it, let the state pay for it. Um, and that obviously has been an argument of mine every year that really, I guess, hasn't been chosen to hold water because everybody would take some stuff that the state pays for and stick it in operations because allegedly that's supposed to make our library better and stronger. Um, I just assume let the state pay for it until they tell us they're not. And then we pay for it because we have to. And to Louise's point, we keep doing this. It, it means we have to do more and more and more because it has to receive, be at that equilibrium or stay afloat. And so why are we chasing our tail here? Just keep the stuff into the state and let the state pay for it. But that's that's a perspective I've had for a long time, but it doesn't seem to. I, I think Rick and Louise are both right, but but that is that is the dynamic, Rick, that you just mentioned. The whole, you know, get to this percentage and it's that percentage. You're 100% right. Yeah, I, so having said all that, I don't know where all this is gonna go, Madam Chair, but. So your recommendation though, Rick, would be to fund the overdrive on WorldCat through the state aid fund? Whatever the state is paying for, let them pay for it and move none of that into the operating account. Let the state pay for it. The town will pay for it when the state says they're no longer going to do it on, on the whole shooting match. So does anybody else want to opine on this? Tom, oh, Josh. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think we, 
we're usually really hard on the library. <laughs> Maybe we give them more scrutiny than other departments. Um, I would, I mean, I understand that they have this other funding source, the state aid department. I think I would just like to know um, how they plan to use the savings from state aid if these monies were moved into the budget. Um, because I don't, um, I mean, I understand Rick's, Rick's point that we don't want to be, uh, you know, having to, you know, increase the, the budget every year uh, just so that we're, we're trying to qualify for additional state aid. Um, but I don't want to hamper the library from, from being able to implement improvements. So, um, I mean, if we could just get an inkling maybe from the library about how they would use these savings if the monies were moved into the operating budget, then, then I, I would feel more comfortable putting these monies into the operating budget. It's usually the can in the back of the parking lot buried, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would support what Josh has said in that, as Louis said, the overdrive and so forth is a fundamental element of the library. I would like to see us re use the state aid funds to look at the possibility of other programs that could be a benefit, but we don't know uh, versus it's clear that the modern world of library is gonna be electronic. So this is a fundamental element of what libraries are and will be doing. So I think it could stay in the basic operating budget and we could use state aid money to look at other things that may or may not be desirable. Jim. Yeah, this is, I th finally I found an issue which I actually remember. Um, but this is the, you're, you're right, Dick, this has been the whole issue for, I mean, literally since I started in 1993. It, and the funny thing is that I think what some of the FinCon members in the past would say is, well, no one else has these state funds. No one else has this additional money. So why are we allowing one budget to get fully funded within the operating budget and yet additional funds to do these other things because no one else gets that no one else gets the same benefit that being said even though i fought back uh, you know on it back in the t in the day i i do kind of see that there is a special place for the library and i and a special place for public education and and free public library and so i guess i i can be convinced either way frankly because it, it doesn't offend my s senses at all that we would use these additional funds for additional items. But I, but I do understand Rick's argument and Tom's argument, I do. Tom. You know, I didn't say it in case it isn't clear. I believe these are very important and essential elements that the library needs. But as Jim just mentioned, it's the unusual circumstance where this one department gets state aid specifically identified for them. And I agree with Rick. I said, let the state aid be used for operational services until it's gone and then we'll pay for it. <laughs> That's how I feel about it too. So, but I'm not, I, I don't want to you know, hold a gun to everybody's head <laughs> to do this. It's not. Yeah. So is there a consensus to remove the overdrive and world cat from the budget? Is that what I'm hearing? I guess I would support Louise uh, because she's the liaison. So admit, ad, ad, you know, not that I want to put it all on her head, but you are the person that deals with them. You're the person that's dealt with them apparently for a number of years. So I'd be inclined, Sorry, to, me? I'd be inclined to, <laughs> to follow your lead. So and that is what to, to, I, to not fund the overdrive plus. I think that was the nice to have, which I don't know that everybody would say it's a nice to have. It's just, if a book comes out that's in high demand, you won't have to wait four months or whatever the wait period is. Um, that's $17,000. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's, this is less 17,000 is what your recommendation is. So I guess the, the, the one other question, and Josh mentioned it earlier, is 
what is the plan for the savings or the continued state aid and and you know, are we continue to have this conversation every year that next year there'll be some other item that will be you know state aid state aid is paying for it now that we want to that's that's one of my concern is that that it will continue to grow on other pilot programs that so but I think you're right, Tom, until they want a new building. And then they'll put in uh, money for the grant funding that gave them the seed money to put in the new library. Correct, John Conley? That's correct. Without, without the town have even signing on to that grant petition. So, yeah. okay. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm no. old in the tooth. It's be almost 830. This is my bedtime. <laughs> Madam Chair? We get to this point every year in this discussion. I know. And we ask ourselves, you know, they got to tell us what they're going to save. Well, I've been sitting here since 2012, and every year we ask the same question, and every year they smile nicely at us and don't say anything. Um, so in essence, let's ask the question for real this time. And if we're not going to ask the question for real, then I say what I said again, let the state pay for everything. So... How are we going to ask them for real this time, what they're going to use to save the money, and what mechanism are we going to use to ask the question? Because if we don't do that, then we're just kicking this can down the road again. Barry? In some respects, they're their own worst enemy, unfortunately, because to your point, Rick, I think there is, I think we're comfortable generally as a group in funding whatever necessary in ordinary services but they never really take the approach unfortunately of saying that we have this other money you know we can use it for these one-time items and you know or we're gonna save money here if we spend it here and it, it just creates this dynamic unfortunately that perpetuates right it's it's frustrating. I mean, I, I, I'm sympathetic to providing, to, to funding services where, which should be in, an or, in the ordinary course in an operating budget. Um, but this seems to, this is a very unique situation. So honestly, I, I, can, I can frankly go either way. I, if, I think if they were more, they work with us more than they seem to be willing to, I'd be more sympathetic to a lot of what they've asked. Josh? Can we send them this question um, and defer this one line item until next week? Louise, we can do that, right? That's fine. And the, and the oh, Tom had a comment first. And my only comment was, uh, Rick, the difference this year is that the town manager has recommended that be included. In the past several years, she has not, so we haven't We've gone past this line and not having to, to worry about it. Well, I guess uh, in fairness to the library, how many years, Jim, Louise, have they been asking for overdrive in the operating budget? No, it's been for It's got to be 10, right? Mm, no. No. I actually can probably give you that information. It, it it's doesn't more than five. No, it's, it's been a lot. It's been a number of years. Uh, it's been a number of years, but... It doesn't I mean, change the product. We, we have added to their budget in the last few years. We added certain positions that were being paid for out of the library um, state aid. So we have, over the last few years, we've added to their budget. There's no question about that. Um, and so in my own mind, in terms of recommendation, it's what is required for the essential services, what we might view as essential services of the library versus the extra stuff. Um, and so they still have the passes, museum passes and that other stuff. Um, they, they still have additional hours for pages. They still have a number of other things in that budget, but every year they spend no more than two thirds of what the state aid amount is, approximately. And what's the rationale for that? That they don't need to spend more than that. That's how they run their business. And right. 
and they and that's and they've come clean on it. They're not trying to hide anything. That, right. That's how they run their business. And uh, Louise, if I can, Madam Chair, Louise, of the hundred and seventeen thousand that's listed in their DSR four, how much of that is paid for right now by the state? Do you know off the top of your head? I can go look, but I yep. think much of my. It know. would be the twenty six plus the three. So $29,000. I am not entirely clear on how they pay for the overdrive plus. Right. And I believe um, the pages, they normally pay out of salary savings. And the other position is an additional new position, that 56 or $57,000 position. I don't remember exactly what it was, but that $56,000 position is an entirely new position. So that is not currently in the budget, not currently paid out of anywhere. And that, and that 56 new position is tangential, is, is tied into that PIO? Well, when we were, when we discussed it, we discussed it um, with respect to the yeah, uh, public information officer. That it's a, you know, it's a similar function and our understanding had been that the PIO would provide some of those services for the library. Right, okay. So I guess the, the open question then is, what are they going to use the state aid funds for? So we right. need that information before we can move on this. Right? That'd be helpful. Okay. And so are you going to recommend not funding anything additional in the library budget pending the answer to that question? I think, don't we have to submit a draft budget next Tuesday? It's due technically the 22nd. Oh, so a week from Tuesday. So oh, we have okay. time. No, we have plenty of, or a week from Monday. We have plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a whole week. <laughs> and that's if we, this is off topic, but that's if we do meet next week, which we typically don't, don't meet during school yeah. vacation week. But other than Barry, nobody seems to be traveling. <laughs> and we do have a final budget recommendation to be made in March as well. So this is the last shot. Okay. So we can get the answer to that one. Um, so let's just keep going because I want to get back to the uh, PIO discussion. Park and Rec. Uh, I had some questions on it. I think they've answered them. I think they've, while it's not clear that they will need all these positions, I think they've managed the um, staffing levels well in the past and if they don't need them, they're not going to spend the money. So I think they've addressed the questions we asked and I'm okay with it as proposed. Okay. Anybody else? So are you all okay to approve Park and Rec? All right. Uh, Memorial Park. And do you have anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, have a, there's, there's no defund police movement here, right? I just want to make sure. Right. right. No, I think yeah, you may recall, I had some questions on the uh, townwide. Uh, I got together with Dave and answered them so I'm comfortable with what they've proposed. So if no one else has any objection, I'm okay with townwide as proposed. All categories. Yeah. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? So then we need to go back to uh, the town manager and the discussion of the public information officer. I, I don't have any further discussion or questions or need for information on my part. Um, what I would propose to get a sense, a consensus from the group is that with respect to that position that we 
continue to keep it outside of the operating budget and propose it as a um, a warrant article for two years. Two years of funding. And does anybody else have comment, Barry? I actually disagree. I think this this position is sort of proven itself. I think, um, you know, as I think, I thought a lot about this, frankly, and I think, you know, that as, as the town has has changed, I think people's expectations in terms of how they want to communicate with the town have also changed with the times. And I think it, the town has been behind to date in the, in terms of how they do it. I think Josh's point previously about upgrading the, the website is is critical and important, but I also think I've seen the value of this of this position, certainly during COVID, but there are also other elements in terms of how the town communicates um, uh, certain issues and maintaining consistency. We've seen problems in the past where they haven't had a, had a consistent message. And I think, um, I think it's been effective. I think it really helps Kate a lot with her job and the expectations that people have of her, of her job. And in the 21st century, I think in a town is you know a 200 million dollar budgeted town with 30,000 citizens to communicate to. I think having one point person for all these departments um, allows these department heads to really focus on the jobs they were hired to do. And so I actually feel pretty strongly that it's a necessary position and we should have it in the budget. I agree. Barry. Okay. Um, so do I. I agree with Barry and Dick. So does anybody else have, I, I personally, I think it's an important position, but I would like to see the utilization of that position post COVID. So I would recommend that I would agree with John and recommend that it be included as a warrant article for two years and then we can better evaluate it. I would agree with John and Carol. Jim? I, I, uh, I'll be perfectly honest. I started kind of at the other end of this debate, but I haven't been there as you guys have um, for the last two years. So I recognize my comments are not as educated as yours, uh, but I'm not convinced. Um, of uh, the importance, as Barry says, of the position. And even if it is as important as Barry says, I'm not convinced that it shouldn't be something that's already uh, being taken care of with inside town government. Uh, we did get the uh, initial results from the uh, staffing levels within the town manager's office. And you've seen that it's gone up approximately three FTEs over this time. And I'm my sense is that it may even be four right? if, uh, if we look at everything. Uh, so I do think that if this is something that is considered to be a top priority for the town, there's an opportunity to do that within the existing staff and not have to add on. But since I don't know all those details and since I'm not privy to them, I think that the, the best way to do it is to not simply throw the baby out with the bathwater, but nevertheless say, let's put on some sort of a, of a, of a, you know, governor on it, and the governor would be a financial warrant article for two years. Or Josh? I would also support a warrant article. Um, I think COVID um, has been very unexpected, um, and I think that the role uh, of public information officer has been beneficial with COVID, but um, it's not clear um, what the role will look like once COVID passes. Tom, did you? Yeah, no, so I, I actually agree with uh, Barry, Rick, and Dick. Um, I am convinced that this is a valuable position as a $200 million operation. Um, having a point person, as Barry said, makes sense to me. In, in, the, in the, I think in the ideal world, it would be great if there was a position that got taken away to have this position, I think. Um, but I think the expectations have changed in terms of 
how people want their information from the town. And I don't, and I, and I think we've had problems in the past and it's been costly problems. And we, we saw that a couple of years ago with the communication towers that turned into a million dollar additional expense that may have not been necessary if, if, the, if, if, the, if the necessity for, um, and, the, and, and the message was appropriately conveyed um, to the citizens and avoided the uproar that occurred um, at the time. And I think there's, you know, it's hard to know, you know, that's one example that I can think of off the top of my head, there probably are others, but I do think, you know, the people that we have in, in that are expected to be the primary communicators for the departments probably aren't, don't have the, uh, have the necessary tools to do so effectively and also coordinate with everybody else to make sure the message is consistent. Um, and I think, again, the expectations is I talk to people on how they want information from the town and that and what the expectations are in this town, in this, in this current uh, economic environment, I think have changed over time. And I think this position is appropriate um, and necessary. Yeah. Uh, Dip. Yeah, just to further, I think the, one of the issues is, I think you learn, you, you grow in this job, you learn and turnover is not a good element in this job because there is the need for institutional memory and so forth. And I think what we're setting up is <clears throat> a high potential for turnover versus getting someone in a career position. So I think this is a not a good way to fill this slot. <laughs> I would I would reiterate what, what, what Dick is saying. Um, <clears throat> this past year, I'm sure, has built a relationship between that person and all the department heads. Um, and just talking to some of them, they rely on this individual a lot for a skill set that they really don't have. And so this individual, I think, has served a purpose that's kind of unified that message. So number one. Number two, to Dick's point, uh, that individual has been here for a year, developed those relationships. And I think we should just, you know, make the position a position. And if it proves out to be decent down the road, then do something with it. But to still make it transitory through a warrant article um, is going to give that person um, pause and wonder, okay, I'm doing a good job this year, but yet I still have to prove myself. Might I find something more substantial and more solid? Um, and number two, by saying that we really don't know what you're doing because of COVID, just makes it far more transitory. Um, so I, I don't think it needs to be a warrant article. I think it needs to be sustained um, in the operating budget. Um, and times have changed. Um, if I can speak for an example, the Exchange Club, <clears throat> which I'm president to. Just this whole thing with COVID has proven how we've relied on Zoom and things such as that to communicate. And the best membership doesn't do that. And so we've had to take special classes for those individuals to get them up to speed. Now, that's just one example of, of many things moving forward, but uh, I, I firmly believe that it should be in the operating budget. Um, we should see the value in it as it is and not make it transitory. So should we just take a vote on this? Yeah. Why don't, why don't we do that? Um, so I, I, I propose that this position be funded for two years as a warrant article. So that would be my vote. Tom? Um, yeah, I would vote that it uh, be included in the departmental operational budget. Okay, Josh? Warrant article. Dick? Operating budget. Rick? Operating budget. John? I've been consistently saying it's a warrant article from the time this first came up and 
uh, despite all the great arguments to the contrary, I still hold on to that position. All right, thank you. Louise, more an article. Barry? In the budget. And Jim? More an article. Five, four. We don't need a, a counter, do we? <laughs> <laughs> so. That's good to have nine members. <laughs> it is. So we're-, we're May, Maybe. Well, I didn't say you were necessarily, but my name is good. <laughs> so we're approving the town manager's budget with the PIO position as a Warren article. Is that? We're recommending. Recommending, excuse me. Yeah. The PIO as a Warren article. But Barry, I think your first point is, is an important one, is that when we add a position like this, there's never an analysis as to, okay, it was the responsibility of five other people or whomever. So how do you rationalize, how do you, how do you then rationalize and take away a position or an FTE? because you're putting this PIO and centralized and everything. And we don't really do that. No, and in yeah. this case, this was, a this was an issue that I think everybody was having to figure out on their own. And I think there are problems that resulted as a result of that in terms of, a, of how things, you know, how, how information is communicated to the community. And having a central way to do that, I think, Frank, my own opinion is I think, makes a lot of sense. We've seen the, certainly seen the benefit of it. Obviously, COVID certainly put a spotlight on it. And I realize, you know, it, it's probably not a good long-term way to assess this position. However, in this day and age, I don't think, you know, we should have the police chief tweeting or the fire department, fire chief, you know, doing his own tweets in terms of, you know, conveying information and which is what was going on. And I, you know, even, or even having select board members individually talking about issues separately and, and inconsistently. So I, I just think it makes us- But we have our federal different. government doing the same, so. What's that? Well, I think- We, we I have think our federal government doing the same. Right, so. well, that's a, that's a different issue for a different time. The prosecution rests. <laughs> Anyway, you yeah, you've heard my opinion. I, I I think I think this is for a town like ours with a demographic like ours, it's 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 an appropriate position. All right, so the only outstanding issue on the um, recommended budget is the question with the library. Is that correct? Great. Um the only other issue I have really is one of scheduling. So as I said, we typically don't meet next week, but you know, should we meet? Is everybody around? Is anybody traveling? Well, you, you can even meet if you're traveling electronically, so. That's true. Yeah, this is a terrible thing for the future. I don't care where you are, you have to meet. <laughs> so, so next week, if we met next week, Louise, we could start the discussion on the Warren articles or? Yeah, I'll talk to Dave about that to see what, what's ready to go. I suggest that would be a good use of time. If I, I, I think meeting just for the library article would yeah. would be um, unfortunate, not because of the library, but just because of it unfortunate yeah. for one article. Um, so if we can get other things on the plate, I would um, I would hope that would be the case and ask for that to be the case. Yeah. So if we can do that and start the discussions on the Warren article, then we should meet. I just wish that uh, Louise had had the library all buttoned up. We wouldn't have to do this. <laughs> Josh. Oh, I just want to say I was um, 
curious just to see the amount of turn back from um, fiscal year 2020. So what I'm going to do hopefully before next week is just take a look at uh, turn back figures uh, from the past uh, three or so years. I'm just curious to see um, any trends and how uh, this past 2020 has been different from other years. When you say turn back, I'm just curious. Is that the infamous spend down? Or no, in other words, what was budgetary savings, unspent budgetary monies? Yeah. Right. So it's it's turn back after the spend down, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Dave Davison, do they still do spend down around this town anymore? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Jim, that's a loaded question. I think on the advice of counsel, on the advice of counsel, Dave's not going to answer that one. You know, he, he didn't unmute on that, did he? <laughs> okay, so we're going to, we will find out if we can start discussions on the Warren article. Be, you know, sure. yeah. And then plan to meet next week. Then maybe we can take care of all the... It'll be normal like the little ones that we normally yeah. vote sound good okay yes. Tom. yeah just um i didn't know if you guys had a chance to look at my notes um but there's some really interesting statistics that came out of the end 2025 report um it's just uh, some of the numbers are just remarkable to me um but the report itself is Pretty long, but interesting if you've got time to take a look at it. Um, I, I was struck by college degree level in the town of Needham, uh, 80, almost 80% of people over 25 have college degrees and 42% have graduate or professional degrees. That compares to Norfolk County has, it's, it's just under 60% with college degrees and under 24% with master's or professional degrees. Was, that was amazing to me. Oh. Um, but, um, but there's some other statistics in there, some other information that uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at the N2025 report, I recommend you take a few minutes. I thought it was a great uh, report, Tom, I did. And uh, what I find to be absolutely amazing is 1979, there's 30,000 people. 2021, there's 30,000 people. A lot of other things have changed, you know, yeah. demographics have changed and, yeah. and so forth. And, and of course, educational level and so forth, yeah. and economic level. Yeah. But it's amazing that the number of people yeah. has not changed for over 50 years. It really is uh, interesting. It is with all the construction, you would think it'd be some <laughs> growth. Well, not making new land. Yeah, no, no land. That's no, but there's been a, a fair amount of multifamily housing developed, and so that seems surprising to me. When I moved into the, up. when I moved into Needham 30 years ago, the family I bought the house from had five kids. The family next door had six. <laughs> and and now that I guess there are families of you know probably two, only two kids in each of those houses, so two or three. So when I moved into Needham, I was one day old. <laughs> <laughs> I think John was the same way. <laughs> Just about. But I think to your point, Barry, when you look at it, right, you know, families of five right. and six did not replicate families of five and six. And oh, so yeah. the multifamily housing only served a purpose to keep us at 30,000 exactly. as opposed to dropping. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not like you would, ex that, that, that it was a good thing we had it because if we didn't, our population would have gone down substantially, not substantially, but would have gone down. Well, that's what Wellesley's experienced. Right. Yeah, the, the, the one of the demographics things, the um, kids between five and 17, I'm trying to, I don't have the notes in front of me, five to 17 in Needham, it's about 20% mm -hmm. of the population versus about 12% in Norfolk County in general. Um, and we're a little bit older too, the 65 plus, we're a couple of percentage points higher than that. Um, but the, the, the young percentage, and people are coming here for the schools, as well as the location and the other amenities, but schools are a draw. No, it says a lot about everything that the town has to offer, frankly, and why families want to be Okay, so do I have a motion to Motion adjourn? to adjourn. Second. Second. All right. Let's just vote on that, Tom. Yes.
Josh. Yes. Dick. Yes. Rick. Yes. John. Yes. Louise. Barry. Yes. Jim. Yes. And, and Louise my, is muted. I, don't I, know. Know. I, I see what she's saying. Yes. <laughs> and I myself. Yes. Out. All right. Great meeting. Thanks, Carol. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you next week. Good night.